All right, then I would say let's start. Hi and welcome to our this week's OP1 lecture. We're in week four. And after we <laughs> talked in the last weeks about classes and objects, we're now going to talk about inheritance this week, um, which is Vererbung in German. And we will introduce some interesting concepts that are um, yeah, a key concept actually, or key concepts for object-oriented programming in almost every language that um, facilitates this feature. Um, just as a reminder where we are in the semester, next week we will continue to talk about some important features of C++, um, but everything we will do this week will be the foundation for everything that follows. Yeah, and we, after today we are already halfway through. That's right, actually, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I think we will start with a short recap that David prepared for yes. us. So I think most of it should be covered uh, today also in the practicals. Um, but this is a short quiz for you, not on Slido, just for you to think about what could be the output. I will give you around about a minute to think. Um, we use here a couple of things, like there is a copy constructor, uh, another copy, con oh, this is a copy constructor, this is a constructor, a destructor, and here we have three lines of code where we create a superhero, we assign this hero one to hero two, and then we call a function called do nothing. And here we see that all these constructors and copy constructors and the destructor print something out. And now just I give you a few seconds to think about what could be the output. So maybe as a short hint, it's not that easy. It's not just one word. It's, I think, altogether we have eight words. Okay, I hope everybody thought a little bit about that. Um, the solution is this. So we have constructor two, constructor, constructor, a copy constructor, constructor, copy constructor, and so on. Um, let's go through it fr uh, from each line. So the first output, this here, is created by this line because we are creating an element and we are calling this constructor here. Maybe a short question. Um, if I have a look at the second and the third type of constructor, um, they are quite similar. They have, they have a const, they have a reference. Why is one of this a regular constructor and why is one of that a copy constructor? Does anyone have an idea on that actually? So what's the difference between the second and the third constructor? Why is one of that a copy constructor and the other is not a copy constructor? Please. Perfect. So a copy constructor is defined by yeah, the constant, the reference, but the, the important thing, and this is what uh, our colleague just mentioned, um, 
we have to have a superhero in that. Otherwise, it's not a copy constructor. Perfect. Yes. So in the first line, we create a superhero, a Superman in this case. So this constructor here is called. The second output is from this line where we just copy this hero one to hero two. This is the copy constructor here. So this one here is called. Then the third line again calls the copy constructor because it copies this hero two into this function. That's why, again, this copy constructor is called. In case this wouldn't be um, called by value, if we hand over a reference, would the copy constructor be called as well or would this be something different? Any ideas on that? What would be the case here? So when we write here a reference, right? Right. Is it also the copy constructor? Any ideas on that? No. no. Why not? Because we need the same like, instance of superhero. Right. Create another one to put into a reference. Perfect. So we don't have a copy then because it's a reference and not a copy that we pass by value. Yeah. So one is left, and when we return here this superhero, again, the copy constructor is called because it returns a superhero, even though I do not take this variable here, but as soon as I write return and then a superhero in this case, uh, the copy constructor is again called. So this explains this output here. Again, I could uh, return a reference, then the copy constructor is not called. Yes? Uh, so before we return, do nothing. We only have this uh, H uh, superhero inside the scope of do nothing, so we didn't construct the third one yet. And then we return it. So is it always uh, getting like constructed uh, one more uh, instance, even if we don't uh, assign, even don't assign anything to it? So if we would write like superhero hero three equals to do nothing hero two, then that makes sense. But if we don't use at all this uh, returned value. Is it always getting constructed anyway? Yes. So if we don't if, if we don't use this return value here, it's always constructed. As soon as you write return here, it will create an object which is exact copy of the existing object. And then we have here four times uh, called the destructor, which are just called after the end of the main function. Uh, because we created here four elements, so four superheroes, and of course all of the superheroes uh, yeah, are deleted then, or should be deleted afterwards. All right, any questions to this? Would this also help you if we have no C out? Because the compiler could just say, yeah, you don't use it, and you... Uh, for example, you do nothing, you don't use the value here, and you are also not printing out something, so it could discard it. So the question is, uh, is the object also created when this body here, for example, is empty? I think it's it's also um, created. Um, I don't think that the compiler watches the, the body of an of a function or a constructor, and if it's empty, then it, it will not construct it. It's, I think it's always, it will be always constructed and created, yeah. So you mean here? So when we write here, uh, this and sign, so this reference, then this copy here will not happen because we're using the same superhero, this hero 2. So in this case, this will not be printed here, this, uh, it's this copy constructor here. No. Yeah, this copy constructor will not be printed because we are using the same element and there's no copy created. All right, then 
Let's talk about animals again. I think we talked about pets and animals are just pets. And I think also in the practicals we saw a dog and an animal. And it was kind of a cliffhanger from Michi and Julia because uh, we want to show you now what this inheritance, all these animals and dogs and whatever means. So imagine our three animals. We have a lion, a fish and a turtle. I know they do not have much in common, but let's say what are their attributes. So a lion has a name and an age. A fish has maybe a name and an age. A turtle also has a name and an age. So at least these attributes are quite similar, but they have different behaviors. So a lion, for example, runs, eats and sleeps most of the day. A fish swims most of the time and eats. And a turtle moves and eats. So we can create now these classes. And we have a lion class here with a name, an age, and all this behavior inside. We have a fish class with a name and the age and the behavior. And also my turtle class with the name and the age and the behavior. But these classes create so much duplicated code because all of the classes have a name and an age and all of them have a method called eat. So the attributes are the same, the methods are the same and we do not want to have duplicated code. So what we can use is so-called inheritance or vererbung and we make kind of abstraction here. So we take all the attributes they have in common and also all the behavior they have in common and use this as a base class called animals. So what we can do is we create our class animal. Animal is now called our base class and everything that all the subclasses they have in common can be represented in this class. So we have again here the name, the age, and a behavior called eat. And what we can do now is, for example, for our lion class, we can write class lion, then this colon, public animal. And when we write it like this, we say that lion is a subclass of animal. So Lion, we also say that lion is derived from animal. Uh, in German, es ist abgeleitet, or this is a subklasse von animal. And we also can do that for our fish class and for our turtle class. So this is just a notation, which means we create a class and we want to have a base class called animal. And then we can remove all the attributes and the behavior which are already in my base class because they are already in the base class and I do not need it in my derived class in the lion and the fish in the turtle class. So I end up with something like this. I have my animal class. I have my lion class, which is derived from animal, my fish class, which is derived from animal, and again, the same with my turtle class. So all the animals, animals still have a name, they still have an age, and they still can eat because of the concept of inheritance, because we have a lion which has this behavior, so a lion can run and sleep, and it has all the behavior from the animal class. So it can also eat, it has also a name and also an age. The same is for the fish and for the turtle class. They have a specific behavior which just belongs to this class and all the other behavior which is from the base class, the animal class in this case. All right, so when we talk about inheritance, we are, yeah, often use the same terminology. We say, for example, a lion is a subclass or a derived class from animal. 
or we also say lion is derived from animal. Animal is a base class from lion, fish and turtle. And as you have seen before in the practicals, inheritance describes a is a relationship. And this means we can say that the derived class is a base class. In this case, a fish is an animal. A turtle is an animal. What would not work, for example, is that when you have um, a name, a name is not an animal. An animal has an attribute name, but it is not an animal. So this is the difference between the attributes and the inheritance. So always when you have these uh, arrows here, this in the UML diagram, this means that the lion is derived, so it is a subclass of the animal class. And what we also see in the UML diagram is something that Julia and Michi also mentioned in the KU. Um, the symbols that we have in the attributes and the behavior, so in the method, in the members and in the methods, um, we have the minus sign, which is a private attribute, and the plus sign, which is public, and this is something that you have here in this notation as well. All right, any questions about inheritance in general, what we've talked until now? We will talk about it, I think, the rest of the lecture, so rest of today, Please. Um, but yeah. Oh, that's a good question, actually. So where do you store these kind of things? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to have per class a different HPP file or CPP file. So yeah, I would definitely do that. Then you would have an animal class f with a class file um, separate. And if you then have a lion or a fish or whatever, then you would put it in different um, files, actually. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so actually, they're like uh, extending the question. So if we have a subclass, for example, line, and it has a method run. Do we have to access it in CPP? Uh, like, for example, void uh, animal uh, two dots, two dots, line, two dots, two dots, run. Maybe not access, but define. Well, define, yeah. Implement. So, yeah, you, you, um, I would always write. The, the methods in the CPP file, as long as it is not just one line. No, my question is, uh, how do we access? Do we have to write animal first? Ah, okay, we will oh, come yeah. to that. We will come to that, how you access, how you access the... So the question is, uh, how do I access the base class methods in the derived class? Yes. Yeah, we will come to that. Yeah. That's a good question. I would also wanted to ask this to David. Yeah, good question. Uh, yeah, definitely. So you can have a real hierarchy of things. You could say, for example, um, a goldfish is a fish. And then it shares some properties with fish, but also with animal as well. So you can definitely do that, yeah. And this makes sense in a lot of cases, yeah. Any further questions regarding that? I think we will clarify a few things. Yep. That's also a pretty good question. We want, we'll postpone the answer because we have like 10 minutes of slides just about that. <laughs> so we will go into detail there regarding these things. Yeah. Also, um, the way around with the destructor, what is destructed in which order. So we will also talk about that in, let's say, 15 minutes. Yeah. We will also come to that. <laughs> yeah. I would say let's go on, <laughs> let's because go on. we will yeah. clarify many yeah. things now. So we have now a short quiz about this UML diagram. Um, so maybe if you want to participate, 
feel free. I will give you again a few seconds or a minute and um, you should see a few statements and you should mark the statements which you think are correct. All right, everybody at least read the answers, hopefully. So let's continue. So yeah, that looks very good. So A is a base class of B and C. That's correct. B is a subclass of A. That's also correct. That's what the easy ones. Objects of class B have a name. So when we go back, objects of class B do have a name because it's in the base class. C is a base class. Yes, that's also correct. It's a base class for D. A is a subclass of D is wrong because A is the base class. And objects of class D have a grade. That's not correct because it's in B. It would be correct if it's in A. But it seems that it was quite understandable. Quite yeah. understandable until now. Um, and now we are talking about creating objects. And this is actually, and this might answer many questions that yep. there were. We start with the first example that we provided here for you. Um, we have an animal with name, age, and uh, eating behavior. Nothing really new. And then we will have another class, lion. Um, which is a derived class from the base class animal. And what we're now going to do is to um, call or to create the new object Simba and to let Simba eat something. And yeah, it works. It's eating. It works. So it's, it calls the eat class, but has no name because we do not define a name here for Simba. We just create an object. So this name is empty here. But as you can see, we can access from the Lion class the eat method, which is in the base class, and we can call this eat method here. So this works. Should we go on? Yeah. Uh, what we're now going to do is to say we are saying the, the animal, the name, and is running and is sleeping, and also again, eat. So we add here in this run and sleep, again, something we want to print out. You can assume that this is std, c out, of course. And we want to access the name in this functions here in run and sleep. Um, yeah, what the happens The question now? now is if it's working. Maybe we will throw this back to you guys. What do you think? Is this working or not?
Any ideas? Yeah. Interesting. The name is private, but we're not saying that explicitly, right? Yeah, but that's the default behavior. Right. So since we're having a class, um, everything where we don't have an access specifier is private. And this is the tricky part here. Since uh, name and age are private, and we are trying to access the names in a derived class, we cannot access it actually, and the, cons uh, the, the um, compiler will actually throw us this error saying we cannot access it. Yeah, so we're accessing a private member that does not work. Any ideas how we could fix this? Yeah. So please, please don't say it. You have to, you can write it on Slido. <laughs> That's cool that you can see how many people are writing. That's pretty cool. Does 46 mean that 46 already posted something? Already posted something, yeah. Oh, that's cool. So that's an open question. Yeah. First time, right? First time open question. Little bit afraid what I will see now. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> 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 Yeah, but I can see some interesting things here. <laughs> of course, we can make it just public. Right. This protected here, yeah, it's also correct. We will come to that. I don't know what this is. <laughs> <laughs> nice, thank you so much for uh, sharing the Lion King ASCII art. So you don't have a maximum <laughs> input number, right? <laughs> make it public, yeah. Implement a get name method. That's also good. Okay. Um, the first thing is we can use a getter, for example. That's what we already have learned. Uh, so we can create here a get name method in the public section of the animal, and we can access this get name method here in the derived class. This would work perfectly. The second thing is that we could use the protected keywords. So we talked about the public keyword and the private keyword, and now we will introduce this protected keyword. And protected means that, uh, yeah, it is still private from outside. So all the members here, the name and the age is still private, but the derived classes can access it like it was public or it would be public. And this is also a possibility to make it available or make things available like attributes or methods for the derived class, but from all the other classes I cannot access it. So we talked about this access specifier, I think In the second, second lecture, yeah, second and we say it okay, there's a public and a private and a protected, but we will come to that. Now is the time where we come to the protected. So protected means that members cannot be accessed from outside the class. However, they can be accessed um, in inherited or derived classes. Right, and I think this was your question from before. What does this public here mean? This is, so in my opinion, in most of the cases, we are writing public here. Yep. Um, it just means how you can access the base class. So in general, you can, you have a base class with normal access specifier here, private, public, and protected. 
So these are these here. And you have a type of inheritance. So this is how you use the inheritance here. And you could also write here public, protected, private. And in most of the cases, you will use public as we have used it here. When you use public, all the public members are public, all the protected members are protected, and the private members are private. You could use protected, then all public members of the base class getting protected, the protected members stay protected, and the private members stay private. I can't see any case where I use private here uh, because all the members are private. But in most of the cases, you will use this here. This is just for completeness. So in most of the cases, you will write public here because you want to access the protected members and the public members of the base class. Um, and again, also for the exams, I don't think you have to know this exactly. No. Nope. Yeah. And I think you don't need it for the assignments as well. No. So I think in, in all the cases, you could write public and that's fine. This is just for completeness. Yeah. All right. Now we are coming to constructors. And this is actually also one of the answers to one of the questions that was asked earlier what is the way things get called when is an object created when we have uh, inheritance let's um, start with the first quiz we're very quiz heavy today <laughs> so have a look at the following example and then we will discuss how things are created so we're having an animal and the lion which is derived from the animal uh, and we have a lion again. So the question is, which constructor will be called? No open-ended question again? No, this is a multiple choice again. Okay. Do we have another no, open-ended? No, we, maybe we discuss it if we want to continue with them. I mean, we could have worse uh, ASCII art, yeah. actually. So maybe we for the next time, if you use ASCII art, please stick to our frame of the text <laughs> box. Fifty is a good number to stop yeah. the quiz. I would say. Great. Okay. So. Yes, most of you already know the answer. Maybe we should stop because they know already. Um, so what happens here? We are creating a lion. And when we do it, so this main function creates a lion called Simba. And at first, the base class is created. So the constructor of the animal is called. That's why it's, print, it's printing, creating an animal. Afterwards, the lion, so the derived class is created. That's why it's printing, creating a lion. And it's always like that. First, the, the base class is created, then the derived class is created. Okay, another example. Um, this is not a quiz, but maybe to think about uh, a few seconds, pretty similar, but the only difference is that we now have here a constructor with an argument with a name. So this is a problem because we, as soon as we write here a constructor with no parameter or with parameters, the default constructor is deleted. So this is something that we discussed also in the last lecture. Think back about this example. If we don't have the entire inheritance stuff in there, and we would just create an animal, we would like that. So um, animal Simba. We would have the same issue actually, because if we don't explicitly write the default constructor, and as soon as we have another constructor. 
um, we get an error from the compiler. And this is what happens here as well. So in this case, uh, the compiler says the constructor of Lion must explicitly initialize the base class animal, which does not have a default constructor because we delete the default constructor as soon as we create a constructor with different parameters here. So this is not, not a good, uh, good sign because we obviously want to create animals, but it's very easy to solve we can use the initialization list of the derived class here to call the base class constructor here. So again, using this column outside of the body here, and we call the animal, so the constructor, hand over a name, and then the correct constructor from the base class is called. This works perfectly. Would this also work? So slightly modification. We do not use the initialization list here. We use the body. So inside the body we call an animal which is called Simba. So we are calling again the same base class. Any ideas? Would this also work? No. Okay. Any ideas why? Yeah, it's creating here a new animal and we still have the same problem that um, it's not the same lion which creates the animal object. So we can, again, we get, we get an error that we must explicitly initialize it. So this does also not work. All right, so a short recap of the constructors. The constructor of the base class is called first, then the constructor of the derived class is called. If it's not explicitly called, the derived class calls the default constructor of the base class. But when there is no default constructor anymore, because we have overwritten it or used another uh, constructor, then there's, there's a problem, so you, you have to use the initialization list to call the correct constructor of the base class. And as I said, the constructor of the base class must be called in the initialization list of derived classes. All right, any questions to constructors and how we construct objects uh, which are have a base class and derived class? Yes? This one? Yes. Um, so the constructors have to be uh, look similar, or I have to give uh, the, the form of the subclass. So you mean this constructor here? Yeah. So I can only call here a constructor which is present in the base class. In this case, we have one constructor in the base class which takes a name. So I can only call here a constructor of the base class and give a name. If I do not hand over a name here, again, there is no constructor from which takes nothing. And then we have, a st this, again, the same error. But if I call a lion Simba with a name, it also wouldn't work, right? To call here yeah. Simba? No, because yeah. this constructor here does not take an argument, yeah. If you want to do it like this, you can. You have to create here also a constructor with a name to take the string name, and then you can hand over this name to the base class. So you can write here std string name inside of the lion, and then create here or right here again that you hand over the name to the animal class, and then you can say here Simba uh, parenthesis Simba to the name. Yes. Can I uh, also make uh, like a line in animal constructor? So whenever I call the animal constructor in animal constructor, it will uh, make a line. No, that does not work. So you cannot create an animal or a lion inside the animal um, because a lion is an animal. It had all the features of an animal. So it's always that... When you, when you create a lion, 
it always tries to create the lion first. So it comes to this constructor here. Then it sees, okay, it is inherited from, from animal. Then it creates the animal first. And then it creates the rest of the lion first. So you can imagine it like this. You cannot say here um, creating, a, creating an animal here. And in the animal constructor, of course, you can create a lion here, but this is not how inheritance works. So then, then you have an animal which has a lion, which is an animal, which is complicated. <laughs> so normally when you want to create a lion, just call the lion and the animal is created implicitly. Uh, No, I don't think so. No. You can you can inherit from more than one class. Yeah. This is a feature that we will probably discuss next week. Let's see. Um, this is something that not really many programming languages support. Um, right. It's the the diamond problem. Many of you, or probably some of you, might know. Um, I think we will cover this next week because this can cause some issues, uh, but C++ also has some ideas how to deal with that, but we will um, probably talk about this next week. All right, now I think we created the, the object now. We want to destroy it as well. So with the destructor, um, it's pretty similar actually. So in, in this example, we created um, for, for both classes, a constructor and a destructor, and what you can see when it comes to the creation of the objects, um, as David elaborated on, the animal gets first created and then the lion. And now the question is, how will the things be destroyed? And yeah, I think it's kind of obvious if you think about it, um, also in um, the opposite direction. So um, first the lion gets deleted and then at the end the animal gets destroyed. That's how the destructor is called in inheritance situation. Yeah, so first the derived class is deleted and then the base class is deleted as soon as an object gets deleted. Yes? It, we will come to that situation or a similar situation in a few slides, but you cannot delete a lion without deleting the animal. The animal is always there. So it is like um, this visualization or kind of visualization. Um, first, you, the constructor of the base class is called, then the constructor of the derived class is called, then you have the lifetime of object you can create with the object. And when you want to um, destroy the object, then the structure of the derived class is called, and then the structure of the base class is called. I think there was one question here. Not anymore, okay. Okay. Yeah. So actually, this is like the regular things that uh, we wanted to cover. And now we're going into some more advanced um, ideas related to inheritance, um, namely the virtual methods. And we will start, how should it be different, with a short <laughs> slide. So what could be the output here? This is something like you said before, a special case. Again, we have the animal with a constructor, we have a lion with a constructor, the lion inherits from the animal. But now we create just the animal object here. We create an animal called Walter. Why? I think I thought of Breaking Bad. I don't know why.
We're aiming for 50 again. Almost there. Almost there. <laughs> Yeah, we are waiting. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe also our practical team have to join that we can reach the 50. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> One more. Yeah. Yes, great. Uh, Stop it. No, this, this was too much. Yeah. No. <laughs> so there is no solution now. <laughs> okay. Many of you said that this will be a compiler error. Interesting. The um, result is just creating an animal. So we can create objects of the base class without touching the derived class. That's possible. Um, and there is no problem in general, but we will come to other methods how to prevent this because creating an animal is kind of odd because an animal, there exists no animal in general, which is just an animal. An animal is always a specific animal. Um, and we will come to that, how we can deal with, that, with this. I think maybe we can reach it today, otherwise next week. But I think there are some questions. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's great. So you're right, it's a compiler error. <laughs> that happens when you copy paste all the day. Uh, yeah, of course, yeah. I think, I think uh, I deleted the name here because I thought there is no need for it and yeah. There is one. There is one, yeah. <laughs> so compiler error would be correct, but if there is no name, then create an animal would be, would be the output. Yeah, so also this slide is incorrect. I'm sorry for that. Yeah, we prepared two examples um, that should motivate why we need for this kind of feature in C++. So actually, in the first example that we're going to show you, we're having two classes again, the animal and the dog class, nothing new. Um, and both have two methods, get sound each. Um, we will have here actually, this is the, uh, the derived class. And now the interesting part, the magic happens in the main. So um, first, we're having here a reference to a dog, so we're calling actually um, new, which will give us back the reference to the heap, and yeah, you know how things are working, and we're doing actually almost the same here, um, except that we are referencing here the dog. So in the first example, um, when this line is called, it returns woof, <coughs> which is the dog sound. Interesting thing, if we do this here, it's not woof, even though we're saying here that animal is a dog, it says generic sound, which we probably won't or don't like to have here, this behavior. So this might get a bit clearer if we're looking at the second example that we um, provided here. Um, let's say, for example, we want to have a function or a method, or here it's a function, that just prints the sound of an animal. And in that case here, um, we say, okay, what is the most abstract or most generalized thing that we have about a dog or a cat or a fish or whatever? It's an animal, because all animals, like subclasses, are derived from the animal. And so we're saying just, okay, we hand over an animal to the function and it should make the specific animal sound, like the woof or the meow or the whatever. Um, 
here in that example, if we're running this code with the same classes that we defined in the uh, last slide, we're having a generic sound here instead of a woof that we actually want to have and a generic sound here as well. Because we are saying here, okay, this is an animal. It's not a dog, it's an animal. So actually the animal behavior will be the behavior that gets called. So this generic, this generic sound comes from here, from the, from, base class. from the base class, and the derived class has this woof here. So what we basically do is we convert a dog to an animal and say, we just take the animal part of a dog and we want to print out the sound of this animal, whatever it is. This is not really helpful for our purposes because our idea was to have a general function that prints the individual sound of the subclass. Okay, um, but since we are trying to get some new cool ideas, we try to actually get some new ideas and we will say, okay, there is a new keyword therefore called virtual. And with this virtual keyword, we're saying, okay, the generic sound is nice, but actually I want that in the base classes, uh, in the, in the uh, derived classes, um, I implement some new behavior, I overwrite the behavior of the base class. So I, as the programmer of the animal class, say, if you want to have a specific animal, please provide me the specific feature, the specific behavior of this animal, like here in case of the dog. And I can do this just by saying virtual. And by doing that, um, this will change here because instead of the generic sound twice, I will have my woof here and my woof here as well since here it's a dog. So it recognizes that, okay, it is an animal, but this function here is virtual. It might be that there is another derived class which overrides this function get sound. So it looks then, so it's kind of magic until now, it looks in the derived class, is there uh, a get sound, so a method which is the same name and the same signature, and then it says, ah, okay, there is something, so I will use this one because it is actually not an animal, it is a dog in this case and also in this case. And what we do with virtual is that we have to redefine a method in the derived class. And this is actually the basic idea that we're aiming with the virtual keyword. There is a related concept which spans like a wide range of possibilities called polymorphism. Um, and we will talk about this in detail the next week because there like the entire lecture is almost about this concept which will help us to um, deal with these kind of things. Um, just think of, for example, um, a class of animals and you, you want to have more specific functionality, like we want to store all of them in, let's say, a vector or wherever in a list. Um, and we want to have like a very general um, list where we can store all different types of animals and if we iterate through the list or over the list or the vector or whatever, um, we want to have the specific behavior of each. And this is actually what um, the polymorphism is about, like to have a very general description about that. Uh, in German, polymorphism is called, uh, I viel Gestaltbarkeit or viel Verwendbarkeit. Um, I think this is a... Viel Gesicht. Yeah. Viel, viele Gesichter, so irgendwie kann, ich kann man es übersetzen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we stay with the polymorphism, <laughs> which is the better term, therefore. All right. Uh, I think that we will also have another question, like not a slider question, but an overall question. What would happen in that case, actually? So we have the get sound. Um, we have a virtual one, and in the derived class, we um, override it. 
in a bit of a different way, actually, we will add a number. So how many times um, the dog should bark or whatever. Would this work or what would happen here, actually? Any ideas? Yeah. It will use the animal get sound because the signature isn't uh, the right one now. Okay, any other ideas? Yeah. A compiler error. Why? Any ideas? Like, again, I have missed the name. No. No, no, it's, it's okay. A, it's, <laughs> it's okay. Why would it be a compile error? Okay, so you say, uh, I declare it here as virtual, so there should be something in the derived class, but there is nothing in the derived class because it's different here. Yeah. Okay? Yes? Yeah, yeah, I wanted to say that we will say generic sound in both cases. <laughs> yeah, but... You're too fast. <laughs> yeah, so it works. Uh, there is no compile error, but I get your point. Um, but virtual is not that strict it does not need to specify all the functions in the or the methods in the derived class. It just says, hey, it could be that there is something in the derived class. Have a look there. But if not, use the method from the base class. So the overall idea is good because um, it's not the same, it's not similar. And so the question is, is a different signature a sign for a new function. And this is what David just mentioned. Virtual is not really strict. And this is the reason why um, in, in C++ there is something called the override identifier. And we're just using this now in this example. And then we'll show you what override exactly does. Um, so here we're saying virtual. And now in the derived class we are saying override. And by setting this identifier, we um, say, okay, look compiler, um, you said that there should be a get sound and I implemented a get sound. But then the compiler says, yeah, you said that, but um, my get sound looks like this and you somehow um, changed that and added a parameter. And we don't talk about that. So uh, in that case, error, because it's not the same function. So override will be a bit more strict and makes um, virtual more strict. So override actually has two purposes in C++. Once these kind of things gets detected, because otherwise this really gets a pain in the ass to uh, detect those kind of problems, first thing. And second thing, for me, as a programmer, it's a good sign that I see, okay, cool, um, this person used override, and so the base functionality, the base method, gets actually overwritten. Yeah? This can be the case, actually. Um, that we have functionality from two classes or from, from like um, two different ones. Um, we will cover this next week and see what's happening in those cases because there are many things that we have to um, yeah, keep track on or where we have to be very careful with. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, um, that's true. Um, some programming languages have this feature. Um, it's called um, multiple inheritance or mehrfachvererbung. Um, C++ supports this feature. This comes with some benefits, but mainly also with some huge problems. <laughs> so how, how we could fix this, that, that there is no error? I mean, we could fix it by being more careful and doing the things that the compiler actually wants us to do. 
by um, yeah, adding a, a get sound where we have also int number or by deleting int number, which in that so case yeah. would make sense because we yeah. don't actually take just advantage just of the number. When we just delete this, then the combination works. So the compiler sees, okay, this is virtual, this is override. They come together. And when I have a dog, I use this method and not this method. Override in general, um, you don't have to write it. It's just, as Alex said, uh, it helps you, but the compiler never says you have to write override. Um, it implicitly overrides as soon as the signature is the same. And in the base class, it's virtual. All right, so I think you already mentioned this. These yeah, sorry. Are the two things, don't worry. The two things what uh, benefits you when, you're, when you use override. So it marks the method of the derived class and indicate um, that the method is already in the base class. So for me as a programmer, especially when you do group work, it's pretty cool when I just see a method in a derived class and I see this override there, I know, ah, okay, it's a functionality from the base class. Um, there is also a method in the base class and I don't have to check all the methods from the derived class and from the base class. Is there an implementation? Because this override identifier tells me already in the derived class that there is an implementation in the base class. And of course it helps you because when you have a typo inside, uh, that changes the signature, for example, then the compiler says you have an error here. All right. I think you spoiled that one a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> uh, don't worry. Um, again, just think about this for a few seconds. We stick to the animals. We have an animal base class, um, a lion and a fish. And all the destructors now have something to print. So it should compile. There is no name there, hopefully. Yes, should, looks good. And in our main function, we create a vector of animal pointers. We call this animals. And we push back a new lion and a new fish. So we have nothing in the constructors here. So there is nothing printed, then maybe we could do something, but what we do here now is we just deleting, so we iterate over all these animals in the vector, in this animals vector, and just delete all the animals. So this is, of course, a very basic case, but this is a, a good short example how you could use inheritance, because sometimes you have a vector of different specific types of animals, like you want to have a vector from all the animals in your game or whatever you are doing. And you can insert here a lion and a fish, and because they are all an animals, because they all inherit from, from animal class, um, you can write here, okay, all my elements inside the vector are animals, they are maybe specific types of animals, but they have something in common that is animal or the animal class. That's why I can write it like this. And this is also very useful when I want to yeah, collect all kind of sp specific uh, derived classes and uh, for example, in a vector. So yeah, what could be the output here in this case? Any ideas? So I have a lion and a fish, and then I iterate through it, and I delete it. Just a small hint, we are still talking about virtual, actually. would be a good idea, yeah. Any other ideas? <laughs> Very diplomatic. <laughs> Basically, it is what yeah, we want, I mean, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the desired behavior. Yeah. Maybe just on this one, because you are um, knowing the disruptor of the character's identity, and then you're not knowing the character, the fish out now. 
Yes, it is. As you said, we are having here animals. And the problem here again is we have no virtual keyword. So the output is deleting an animal and deleting an animal. Because we have two animals inside. They are uh, yeah, like converted to animals. So we just use here the animal pointer. So the program just have a look at the animal class sees, okay, there's a destructor, I print this, and it's done. Yes? Uh, but the objects will be deleted correctly? The objects will be deleted correctly, yes, but it could be uh, a problem of what you've seen in the practicals. When you, have, uh, when you have something here in the destructor, you have to clean, maybe making a deep copy, then um, this lion, for example, or this fish destructor is never called, and this could lead to a problem. Yes? When I use auto star here, yes. good question. So I don't know exactly, but I would assume it's a vector of animal pointers, so I would assume it stays the same like this, but you can try it. Yes? I don't get the, the first the first part. Yes? So okay, the question is would only the lion uh, the animal part of the object be destroyed and not the fish part and the lion part? No, so it will delete the whole object. But as I said before, if you have something in the destructor here, this will never be executed. But it will uh, delete the whole object and remove the whole object, yes. All right. I think we can fix this quite easy. Yeah. Any ideas how to fix it? Yeah. At virtual, yeah. Where? Exactly. That's the fix. So when we write here virtual, again, we have the same thing as before. When it comes to deleting the object, the destructor is called. And at runtime, it says, OK, this is virtual. It might be that there is a derived class. Maybe you have a look at the derived class. OK, there is exactly one lion and one fish, uh, which has this implementation of the destructor. And then it is deleted correctly. So it first deletes the lion, then deletes the animal, and then it deletes the fish, and then the animal. All right, any other questions to that? Yeah, then I think let's sum the things a bit up. Yeah. So we talked about two things actually that happened here. Um, these things are in literature oft referred as early and late binding. Early binding is the thing that happened first without using virtual. So the function is by compile time associated to an address. So it's cool because we here we have a concept where we said in, in C or in ESP, we'll not use that too often, but now we're using it actually, so-called function pointers because the function is also in the memory and we can access this by like accessing the address. So a function pointer is nothing else as an address to the particular part in memory where this function actually is and then we can run this function. And this is actually the magic behind, um, behind the functions that we had here. So with early binding, so don't having virtual, um, at compile time it gets clear if the animal probably, or like in that case it was the animal, um, get sound should be called. And with late binding, we're doing um, this in the runtime. So it's not predefined already at the compile time, it's at the runtime when the program runs. Um, there it gets clear uh, using the pointer, um, using virtual, 
which sound, for example, should be made. And this is called late binding. And this happens through a so-called virtual table, V-table. We will talk about this in detail next week as an um, outlook for next week. But actually, what happens if we are using virtual, two things are happening, and those things will be um, part of our huge thing that we will cover next week's lecture. Um, we have two things, a virtual table, and in this table, um, we store, or the compiler stores the information, um, which dedicated method should be called, and a pointer in a class to this virtual table. So using virtual has a disadvantage though, um, when we use that virtual keyword or when we're making a function virtual or method virtual, um, we're having some extra space that we have to uh, think of for the virtual uh, table and also for the virtual pointer. How this exactly looks like will be covered in next week's lecture. But I think now we want to summarize the yeah. virtual keyword or like the, the concept behind virtual. So if you want to override a method in the subclass, you have to mark the method in the base class as virtual. As we have seen, this sound method uh, or the destructor. Um, as a hint from my perspective, you should always mark destructors as virtual. There is a small yeah, problem, not a problem, but a small disadvantage. This is just the, the overhead you create because you create an entry in this V table. But this is, in my opinion, neglectable. Yep. So my perspective, when you create a destructor, create it virtual because uh, otherwise you might get memory leaks because the destructor of the derived class is not called. And I would also suggest to use override in the derived class, as we have said, just to make sure um, that you want to override this method in this case. And yeah, as, before, as I said before, there is a small disadvantage when using virtual so-called runtime costs. So you have more memory you need or your program consumes a bit more memory because there is a table which stores all the methods you created or you used uh, or declared as virtual. And there's also like a small, it, it takes a small, a bit more time because all when you, or as soon as you use a virtual method, it have to find it into V table and iterate over it, but I think we will come to that next week. Right, and so we're perfectly on time. Um, I would say let's close today's lecture. Thanks for participating, thanks for being here. See you next week. <laughs>